Hello. Welcome to this talk, which is called Duxbury in 1918, Influenza Rages. So we'll talk about the Spanish flu influenza pandemic as it pertains to Duxbury, but we'll also look at Duxbury in the year 1918 and what the town was like then. This is a map showing uh, Duxbury uh, about that era, and uh, you can see that it shows roads and um, the train line and all of that. Um, but Duxbury was a very simple town back in 1918, and we'll learn more about that coming up. Duxbury in the year 1918 was a small town, but it was on the brink of a change in that year, the way many towns and, and in fact this whole country was um, in that year. Duxbury's year-round population was about 1,500 people. Its summer population swelled to somewhere around three to 4,000, uh, and it was a very rural town, so there were a fair number of horses, a fair number of cattle, and lots, as you can see from the numbers from the town report for that year, of fowl. That means chickens, ducks, and geese. And a lot of Duxbury families raised chicken, ducks, and geese um, for income. Uh, they were brought to the markets of Boston, but they were also uh, sold to their neighbors as well as to uh, the summer families who came to Duxbury. Lots of um, people in Duxbury who lived here year-round had multiple jobs. Uh, they were fishermen, uh, they harvested clams, and even a few oysters. Uh, they were, uh, they had wood lots where they cut wood and sold wood, mainly for firewood. Uh, the, some had cranberry bogs. Uh, many of them worked for the summer families who came to Duxbury as caretakers and other help like that. And so they got by, but um, much of that would change over the course of the next few years after 1918. There was train service in Duxbury in 1918. Uh, there were four trains a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. And um, uh, it was a, about an hour and a half trip. It was the old colony line, uh, but it had been taken over by the New York, New Haven, and Hartford uh, Railroad Company by then. And uh, it wound through the towns of Marshfield, Situate, Cohasset, Hingham, and then on into um, Weymouth and Quincy and then Boston. There were three train stations in Duxbury. Uh, Millbrook, uh, right along Railroad Avenue, as this picture shows. Uh, there was South Duxbury, which we'll see in a minute, and a small station at Island Creek. And then that line hooked into the Kingston Line, which was a different branch of the Old Colony Railroad uh, that serviced um, Plymouth, Kingston, and some of the inland towns. It was a it was a, a frequent uh, many year-round people as well as uh, summer visitors used uh, the train service in 1918. Here's the South Duxbury Station, which stood um, off of South Station Street. It was quite an active station in the summer because many of the summer visitors used that station um, for coming and going. In 1918, automobiles or cars were quite common on Duxbury roads. They had not been even five years previous to that. There were two main roads in Duxbury, one that was called the Coast Road, which today is Tremont Street or Route 3A, uh, and then the Boston Road, that's Summer Street, High Street, and parts of Route 53 today. And those were the ways north and south. Uh, much of the roads in Duxbury were dirt, uh, and those that weren't were stone or macadam roads, and they were in poor condition. There was an August 1918 town meeting um, that was uh, termed an indignation meeting by the town selectmen in 1918 because it was 
uh, demanded by the summer residents of Duxbury who complained bitterly about the condition of the roads. And so $5,000 was voted to improve the roads, mainly those that the summer visitors used quite a bit. But uh, cars were becoming more and more common in Duxbury in 1918, and that was getting to be more the preferred um, way of travel across the country. Duxbury had a poor house or an alms house still in 1918. There were uh, eight residents or inmates, as they were called back then, and um, a keeper of the alms house and his wife. And these were generally older uh, people who had uh, very little uh, material uh, goods uh, and very often um, hardly any families. And so they were uh, lived in the almshouse and worked some of the gardens and things like that. Um, but it was a, a form of... Um, care. There was also quite a bit of outside care, uh, charitable care, that the town provided to families and individuals throughout the town if they got sick or if they were infirm or had a, a number of needs like that. And um, that kind of uh, detailed uh, description of, of what people received, um, medical care was another thing, uh, is detailed in the 1918 town report. The schools in Duxbury were older and there was already complaints about the condition of the schools in 1918 and it, it was leading up to, in the next 10 years, replacement of many of the school buildings in Duxbury. There were only 271 students in the schools in 1918. There were 12 graduates from Partridge Academy, which was the um, town high school at the time. There were 13 teachers um, across uh, all of the, the buildings in, in uh, Duxbury. And there was Partridge Academy, which was grades 9 through 12. And there was the Village School and the Tarkland School and we'll see a picture of one of them soon. Those were two-room um, two room buildings that housed a number of uh, grades. And then there were still six one-room schoolhouses in Duxbury. This is the village school that stood on Washington Street. It was known as the Green School because it was green in color. It housed grades four through eight. Um, in 1918, and it had 68 students in those grades. It had a, quite a population boom um, at that time. And the younger grades were in some of the, um, the other one-room schoolhouses, and then the older grades went to Partridge Academy. This is the Ashdog School, which was a one-room schoolhouse, had 14 students and one teacher. It stood on Keene Street and serviced the sort of northwest part of Duxbury. Keene, Union, um, uh, that area of, um, of Duxbury towards uh, the Pembroke Line. There were a number of community halls uh, throughout Duxbury. This is one of them, the Oddfellows Hall or Mattachiset Hall. It was probably the most popular. Um, it stood up and still stands on Washington Street. Um, and uh, But it was most popular because it showed moving pictures or s they were silent movies at the time. And uh, they were shown uh, throughout the year, not just in the summer. Uh, but it was a lodge um, hall for the Oddfellows. Uh, which they then also rented out. But there were a number of these kind of halls throughout the town. There was the Island Creek Hall in that part of town. There was Temperance Hall out in uh, West Duxbury and a number of other ones in the Washington Street area. Ice boxes were common in 1918 Duxbury and the ice generally came from the local ponds. This is the Cushing Ice houses on the um, on the pond uh, 
the Little Island Creek Pond, as it was known, uh, which is along Route 3A, um, right uh, near uh, Flintlock Drive. And uh, you can see the Cushing's um, ad that they delivered ice throughout Duxbury and Standish Shore and Kingston. And uh, the large blocks of ice were cut in the winter from the ponds. Uh, they were pulled out with large tongs, and then they were brought up, slid up that ramp uh, into the ice houses and were covered in sawdust, uh, um, and that protected the ice throughout even the hottest summers, and then were delivered to local families. No talk or story about the year 1918. Um, should not include some of the beginning part of that year. The winter of 1918 was bad. There were a number of storms and um, snowstorms and all that happened uh, early in the year. This is a news account from February about one that um, uh, caused lots of large ice flows out in the bay. And um, there was a fear that uh, the Duxbury Pier Light or, or Bug Light would be um, swept away by, by the ice flows. They also um, were uh, quite damaging to the Powder Point Bridge. Um, and it would, um, it raised up the bridge something like eight feet. Um, it, it, the ice flows uh, pushed up the, the pilings. And so the, the, um, the decking of the bridge rose up about eight feet, according to this article and uh, had to be ironed out again once the, uh, once the ice flows disappeared and um, the, the bay was unfrozen. There were also uh, road issues and um, gypsy moth issues uh, during the uh, spring and summer months. Um, Duxbury had its regular March town meeting where all kinds of um, uh, issues were, were brought up, including the bad roads, which were postponed, and then the issue was eventually forced by the summer visitors in August of 1918. Gypsy moths, uh, there was a, a full-time gypsy moth warden who um, sprayed around town because they were such a, a bad infestation. There were the shade tree uh, warden, and because of the gypsy moths and other pests, a lot of the trees, particularly in the eastern part of town, were, were being uh, killed uh, by these uh, bugs and, and moths and all, and so uh, they had to put money towards that. More than anything, uh, Duxbury was a town for the summer, and uh, a large part of the buildings in Duxbury were owned by out-of-towners um, who came here in the summer months um, from all over, but certainly from the towns uh, surrounding Boston. And Brockton was another um, uh, place where a number of um, families came to Duxbury because it was a direct route um, uh, from the city of Brockton. But they came in, in um, model uh, tees like this in the left hand uh, picture, uh, and they had blowouts and, and things like that. They took the railroad, but they came to cottages uh, like on the right and um, and settled in for the summer. Um, often the, the men of the family would take the trains into Boston if, if that's what they needed to do for their business. Um, but it, it was, uh, it, it uh, doubled, if not more, its population. Uh, starting in June. The majority of Duxbury summer visitors owned real estate or rented real estate here in uh, Duxbury. So they had summer cottages and camps uh, of varying sizes and, and degrees, but there were still inns and hotels here, uh, mainly along uh, the, Saint George, the uh, Washington Street area. The one on the left is the Colonial Inn, which you will recognize as being um, the uh, Nathaniel Windsor Jr. House, uh, now owned by the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. That was owned by a man named Maurice Chandler in 1918, and he owned 
uh, the Bayside Inn across the way. He was noted because not only was he a, um, a good innkeeper that uh, catered to auto groups, as his ad said, but also in, uh, not in the Colonial Inn, but in the Bayside Inn, uh, there was gambling uh, allowed in uh, one of the buildings on the property. The St. George House uh, was also on Washington Street, up closer to the Bluefish River. It was run by a very popular man, George Scott, and his uh, and his wife. Uh, they were African American, had been in Duxbury for uh, a number of years, um, 30, 35 years, and had a small inn and a small sort of um, restaurant eatery on the first floor too, and uh, were very well thought of in town, and it was a it was a popular inn. Duxbury never had large summer hotels, uh, or many uh, large summer hotels. The largest was the Mile Standish Hotel out on Standish Shore, but by 1918 it had closed and it was broken into two large uh, summer houses. The one that, that continued uh, was the Powder Point Hotel or the P Powder Point Hall shown in this picture. It was um, the dormitory um, built by Frederick Knapp, who was the head of the Powder Point School, and he uh, cannily uh, and uh, very market savagely turned it into a hotel during the summer months, uh, and families came and stayed here and in some of the other buildings. This was the newer Powder Point Hall. Uh, it was built in 1913 after a devastating fire that burnt um, an older wooden uh, one. And, and this, uh, Frederick Knapp was very determined that this would not burn, so it was made out of stucco and stone. Like I said, the Scott family had a small um, eatery restaurant uh, in, in their hotel, the St. George House. Um, this was another one, the Hillcrest, uh, which stood on, um, and the building is still there, uh, on the south side of Captain's Hill, just off Crescent Street near Howland's Landing. Um, and it too had uh, some rooms uh, to, to uh, as a small hotel, but it was also more well known for its um, its table, as it was called, its small restaurant on the first floor, where shore dinners were served, which were, as you would guess, uh, lobsters, clams, uh, mussels, um, and the Hillcrest, which was run by the Smith family, were noted for their, um, their their breakfasts too. They had um, apparently stupendous waffles that they served uh, at the Hillcrest. So there were small eateries in Duxbury. There were never large uh, restaurants uh, in 1918, and there were very few of them actually in that um, time. The summer community and colony, as it was called in Duxbury, um, uh, came from, as I said, the Boston area. Um, and this was one of the um, scandals that erupted in March of 1918 involving one of the families of uh, the summer colony here, the, the Young family. Frank Young was a very um, uh, well-off, uh, wealthy uh, oil company owner who had a large estate in the Ashmont section of Dorchester, which was very fashionable then. He built the house on the left um, as a summer house on Powder Point. Uh, it still stands. It was a very large, uh, commanding summer house. Um, and not to get too much into the gossip, but his um, his older daughter, Rosmond Young, shown in the other picture, um, created, well, she and the uh, Boston Symphony Orchestra conductor, Carl uh, Mertz, Muck, sorry, um, uh, created a scandal because although he was married, she was his lover. Um, and um, this was all caught up in the whole um, war mania about German Americans and Germans and, and the xenophobia about people from Germany and how they would um, 
uh, be spies and anarchists and, and all of that. Um, Karl Muck was a, a, a German nationalist. He was brought to Boston to, to run the symphony orchestra, to be the conductor. He was apparently an excellent conductor, uh, but there were many um, uh, complaints that he was um, not American enough. And somehow the scandal of his um, young lover, Rosman Young, came out. He was jailed. He was eventually put into a, um internment camp um, for uh, German-Americans who were suspect of, uh, of uh, being spies and all, um, which he never really was... Um, there was never any good evidence about that. And then he was eventually um, deported back to Germany. Uh, so this was a scandal that broke open in March of 1918 and engulfed one of the most prominent summer families in Duxbury. The business areas of Duxbury were numerous and small. Uh, this is um, looking down Washington Street towards Sweetser's. Um, it wasn't known as Snug Harbor then. That uh, name did not come about until the 1930s when there was a restaurant there called the Snug Harbor. So it was just known as Sweetser's, um, a big general store full of everything that you could want. Um, and it was very uh, run uh, very uh, popularly by uh, several Duxbury families. Also in this area was Jocelyn's uh, Variety Store, which was only two doors down, but held its own for many years um, in a kind of niche market um, against Sweetser's larger store. And you can see what they what they carried, tonics, cigars, newspapers, uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, and it appealed, uh, both these places appealed to year-round Duxbury residents as well as the summer visitors. Also in this area um, were the kind of new and the old. Um, on the right is the Duxbury Coal and Lumber Wharf, which is where the Maritime School is today. And you can see a two-masted schooner there. It was a series of rambling um, lumber uh, uh, storehouses and warehouses. Uh, it was a very successful company that not only dealt in lumber, uh, but coal and hardware and paint and all kinds of things. And, um, and that had been going since the 1870s. On the left is uh, one of the earliest pictures of the uh, Yacht Club building which was completed in 1914. So by 1918, it was only four years old, but it was the epicenter for many of the um, summer visiting families who lived on Powder Point or Washington Street. Um, and these were largely families from the Brookline Newton area who were used to having country clubs and all. Um, and so the Yacht Club was built to, to reflect that sort of desire for a um, uh, uh, up-to-date um, yacht club clubhouse where parties as well as uh, yacht races could be held and then up the street um, in the Parker family fields they had begun a, a golf club or golf course which eventually became uh, where the yacht club still has its uh, golf uh, courses today. So this area reflected both the old and the new Duxbury that was happening in 1918. Hall's Corner was another business area of Duxbury, but it, uh, again, it's not anything like what we know Hall's Corner as today, or even what it was like 10 years later um, by the late 1920s. In 1918, it was a crossroads, um, and you can see uh, this is a picture looking up Depot Street um, towards the railroad station. That's the Hall's Tavern uh, on the site of where the um, Verk gas station is today. Uh, that was a 
lent its name, obviously, to the corner. The Hall family ran a tavern there for many years. It was eventually sold and taken down piece by piece uh, in 1930 and brought to Cambridge, where it's been reconstructed there, and you can, you can see it there today as a private home. But this was, um, this was a very um, uncommercial crossroads uh, in, in Duxbury in 1918, although was considered kind of the town center even then. These are a couple other views of Hall's Corner. The only real commercial building in 1918 was the post office and store there on the left. You can see with the um, with uh, George Stearns, who was the postmaster and store owner. Um, and that is the second building on the left in the postcard view on the right there. That's looking down Standish Street. And you can see that none of the one-story commercial buildings that are there today existed back in 1918. They were all built starting in the early 1920s through the late 1920s. And all those buildings you see in that postcard view are still there. Um, the only one that is still in its original place is the post office store, which is now the chiropractor's office. All the other houses were pulled back, swung around, uh, and are back behind the building uh, blocks that we have there today. So it was a very different Hall's Corner in 1918. Another area, business area of Duxbury that was frequented uh, was what was called Town Square, which is where uh, Washington Street meets St. George Street and Cove Street and Powder Point Avenue. And that's what we're looking at in this picture. We're standing on the Bluefish River Bridge looking north towards um, the, um, the intersection there with St. George Street. You can't even see the cable house, which is there. You can see the chimneys, but that was a, a very active cable station in 1918 still. You can't see the Drew house, uh, which is there. What you see is a clutter and, and um, collection of all kinds of um, uh, businesses and buildings that were built all on those fragile wetlands uh, on the uh, that side of the Bluefish River. Um, the one on the left it was one of the most popular. It was Tony Lucas's barber shop. He had a laundry too, where you could drop your laundry off, and that was his uh, family home too. That was eventually moved off and moved to Old Cove Road. And then the right side of the building were all kinds of uh, other businesses that were owned by Henry Briggs. This was Henry Briggs's main uh, building on the Bluefish River, and it's his garage. And you can see it really reflects uh, that, that change happening in Duxbury and all over the place about the frequency of, of autos. And this was built right out over the marsh. You, you can't even tell it's, it's sitting uh, out in the marsh, but this was his garage. Um, and uh, he also, in one of the other buildings, had a livery stable. And we'll learn more about other families who did that as well. But uh, this whole business area of Town Square was popular with the Powder Point families and the Washington Street families because uh, a lot of the services that were offered there, there were some small grocery stores and all, and the garage and things like that, were uh, helpful to them and, and to the people who worked for them. Of course, in 1918, Duxbury Beach was there. The bridge was there, um, and you can see in that right-hand picture, um, it just uh, came across, and, and people just parked either at the end of the bridge or on the bridge, which is what those cars are doing in that postcard view. Um, the dunes were beautiful and big, as the left-hand uh, postcard shows you. But what was very different about Duxbury Beach then was that it was still owned by the Wright family, so it was privately owned in 1918, but people in Duxbury, visitors regarded it kind of as a almost a public beach. The Wright family, um, and we'll learn a little bit more about where they were in 1918, 
<clears throat> um, owned it, but really never went out there. Didn't have uh, so there were shacks built on the beach. There were gunning uh, shanties for for hunting built out there, and people just went out there. You know, they left trash. They swam, but it it was it was popular, but it was not anything that was regulated or even owned uh, or or leased by the town in 1918. 1918 was one of those years where uh, it was uh, cars and automobiles were still fairly new. Um, but uh, and this is uh, the tragic result of, of one of those encounters where in the summer, in August of uh, 1918, um, this small boy was uh, hit by a car on Washington Street driven by a um, summer visitor and he died. Um, and there were, if you look at the newspaper accounts anywhere in, in that era of 1918, there were accidents galore, there were terrible tragedies like this of people being um, uh, hit by cars and all because it was, cars were still, um, uh, they often had inexperienced drivers uh, behind the wheel. They were still somewhat of a novelty, although becoming much more common, and pedestrians and, and others were still not used to how to deal with them, and maybe were not still used to how to deal with them. Um, but this was a, a terrible tragedy that happened in the summer of, of 1918. But automobiles were becoming more common in Duxbury, and um, the need for garages uh, were were increasing. And as we saw with Henry Briggs's uh, garage down on the Bluefish, um, there was also uh, one of the early garages was the Herricks up on Tremont Street, a very strategic location on the, near the corner of Chestnut Street. It's where the Holy Family Church is today. Um, they had a long, uh, uh, long association with uh, a, a garage uh, on that property, and they sold Ford cars as well, and uh, they got a lot of, um, of traffic uh, going back and forth on Route 3 between Boston and the Cape. Another one of the families that saw the change in, um, in transportation and, and were capitalized on it was the Cushing family. And this is their garage in Hall's Corner, stood on the corner of um, Chestnut Street and Depot Street, where the Verk Dunkin' Donuts building uh, is today. And that was their later garage, uh, as they had more success um, with selling cars and, and repairing cars. But this was their earlier garage. Um, and it was run by the younger uh, Cushing um, generation. Paul and Earl, they were the brothers, um, who were mechanics, chauffeurs um, for the summer visitors, um, and really knew uh, engines and, and all. And they started a, a very successful garage um, that grew and grew and grew. And you can see uh, they are in, um, in this picture along with their father. Um, and their younger brother, and a uh, probably a cousin. But it was a time of um, of change and 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 reluctance to change. Um, here we are. There's two ads. There's the Cushing and Crocker livery stable and boarding stable that the that the Crocker senior members of that family ran on Standish Street, uh, right near the post office. And they had, um, in 1918, still a, a, a steady business of boarding um, people's horses and carriages, particularly summer visitors, but leasing um, ones for, for people who needed that. Um, and But you can see there, there that that is shifting. They're, they're, um, they're also sawing wood. Uh, but that next generation of, of Cushings have already gone in the automobile direction. George Belknap up in North Duxbury on the right-hand side, too, was also trying to straddle that, um, that um, carriages versus automobiles. And here he is. He's a 
harness maker and a saddle maker, um, and yet he's offering automobile trimming as well, um, because he too could could see that that was a, a coming thing that that he needed to uh, to try to capitalize on. We've talked about the summer visitors who came flooding into Duxbury by all different ways and stayed um, a week or a month or three months or whatever. But uh, there were year-round families, and um, there's lots of stories about how they made their living. And, and But one of the large uh, ways was they, they supported the summer families that came here. They fixed their houses. They were maids, chauffeurs, gardeners, kept the estate up. They were housekeepers. They, they caretakers uh, checking on the, on the houses in the winter season. Here's a great picture of uh, Grace Holmes and her sister Elva, who uh, they are standing in the um, town square area. So that's the bluefish in the back ground there and um, they were young women at, at, in 1918 and um, and uh, they made their livings uh, as you will see in a minute um, through uh, through different ways this is um, the Cushing ice cream store uh, or Courier's ice cream store sorry uh, that stood on the bluefish it was one of those uh, buildings uh, right near the cable house so on that side um, of, uh, of Washington Street right near the St. George Street corner um, and this is where um, the the home sisters worked they worked for the Turner family and that's Mrs. Turner out front who ran um, an ice cream parlor basically um, and um, and it catered to largely the the summer visitors and the staff that came with those visitors. Uh, you can see it's for sale there in the corner. So I don't know how successful it was, but, um, but the uh, home sisters worked there for a number of years, particularly after, um, uh, after Grace uh, got married. Here is Grace uh, uh, on the back of her husband's motorcycle. That's Elliot Holmes in front and uh, Grace in the back. Um, this was an early Harley motorbike. Um, and these these were getting common in Duxbury too. But the fact that um, both that Elliot could buy this uh, um, shows uh, his entrepreneurial spirit and and livelihood because he was a chauffeur to a summer family he was their caretaker he was sort of an all-around handyman uh, but he was um, like the Cushings like the Herricks like the Briggs uh, was very adept at mechanical things and um, uh, this clearly was his pride and joy I'm not sure Grace uh, Holmes uh, looks so thrilled to be riding it um, but this was something that uh, you know, a year-round family um, that um, was careful with their with their um, income could afford. Uh, Grace and Elliot also later were able to buy one of the the houses um, on Washington Street, one of the nice old um, ship building era houses, um, and and raise their family there. So they clearly did well um, over the years. Now we come to the time uh, in uh, 1918 when the Spanish lady arrives in Massachusetts. And by that, what I mean is what was known as the Spanish flu um, or the, the influenza of uh, 1918, which was so devastating to uh, the country, the world, uh, and even uh, little Duxbury. Um, but uh, it broke like a wave, uh, particularly on Massachusetts. Um, this is a little um, ditty or, or song that people knew uh, during the, the pandemic. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened up the window and, window and in flew Enza. It was a jump rope song. It was a song that kids used, but it was, uh, it, it, it shows the, um, the, the sort of, um, overwhelming um, inability for for people to um, to um, be able to um, 
deal with the, the influenza pandemic. Uh, like I said, it, 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 one of its big early epicenters was Boston, Massachusetts. And that was because um, as the war was beginning to wind down in September, there were, uh, and, and there were troops coming and going um, from Europe, and m many of them transited through Boston, particularly the Navy troops. Um, and the, the flu broke out amongst the, um, some of the troops uh, that were on um, ships in Boston Harbor. The other big place in Massachusetts where there was a large outbreak was, of course, the Army camp at uh, Fort Devens in Massachusetts. Um, and those deaths ca came early, they came quick, and they were, they were just awful. Um, and they were, there were just hundreds of, of men who died. Early, starting uh, late August, early September, you can see the first deaths, uh, first uh, civilian deaths were in early September. Um, and then by the middle of the, uh, the month, we see that um, Percy Coville and Charles Boomer died, not in Duxbury, but they were um, Duxbury men uh, who were living elsewhere. Percy's um, family lived in Millbrook. He was living in, um, in Boston. He was working for a real estate agent. He was a young man, newly married. Uh, but he clearly fell very ill in, in one of those early waves. Charles Boomer, who we'll talk about uh, in more in depth in a bit, was in the Army uh, and in an Army camp in Syracuse, New York, when he sickened and died. And um, if you read the stories of the men that died in the Army camps, it's really just heartrending to see the conditions and the the sheer volume of men that just had no chance against this influenza pandemic. Um, by September 27th, the Old Colony Memorial was reporting in Duxbury that there were quite a number of cases in town. So although there was some delay um, in, in the influenza reaching Duxbury, um, by late in the month of September, it was here and in, in quite some numbers. Um, more Duxbury men uh, died later at the end of the month. Um, Harold Sampson died in Quincy. He worked for the railroad stations. George Solace died in um, Kingston. His, uh, his young son was born after he died. So tragic, tragic circumstances for these, uh, these families that had the early deaths. By October, we see that um, the influenza epidemic has has gripped Boston and Duxbury. Um, it was, of course, in the middle of the war, um, and they were still having a Liberty Bond loan parades um, to raise money for the war effort. Um, luckily, Boston had the foresight to cancel those parades, and although the death toll in Boston was horrendous, it was nothing like Philadelphia, which did not cancel its uh, Liberty Loan parades, and there were just hundreds of thousands more people that died because of that. Um, but by early October, Duxbury has its first death from influenza. A young woman, Harriet Higgins Anthony, who grew up here in Duxbury, she was a young mother, she had three young kids, and she was the first um, recorded death of influenza in Duxbury. And you can see her gravestone there in, in, um, in Mayflower Cemetery. Um, very quickly in early October, the Duxbury Nursing Association got organized and they clearly made a huge difference for their town people. It was a it was a volunteer organization. It was largely women, um, although the two doctors in town, Nathaniel Noyes and Roger Spaulding, were, were certainly um, part of that. But but these women recognized early that it was the women who were getting sick, uh, the women who had been taking care of their their husbands and children who, who also might have been getting sick. So um, they had milk broth and bedding committees uh, that that um, went to the families throughout Duxbury who, who needed those things and needed the care. The other um, angel of mercy, you could call her, uh, was a wonderful public health nurse who came from New York that was hired by the 
Duxbury Nurse Association, and she has that wonderful name, Angela Prey. And she came, rolled up her sleeves, and went to work among all the sick families and sick people in Duxbury. And she clearly made a big difference. And um, and I'd love to know more about her, but, but she... Um, after about six months, she returned back to New York. Um, in early October, all the schools, churches, and gathering places were closed um, in Duxbury, as they were throughout the state. Um, another Duxbury boy died in Bridgeport, Connecticut. He also worked for the railroad. Um, and late in the month, Earl Freeman died, um, and he um, had been living here in Duxbury and um, was also a young man with a young family. And you can see his gravestone, too. So you can see these families began to really suffer in Duxbury. Um, and uh, their family members that died of the flu uh, were buried in the family plots uh, throughout Mayflower Cemetery. By November uh, 1918, uh, the influenza epidemic was ebbing a little bit in Massachusetts and in Duxbury. Not by too much, but um, we only have one confirmed death in Duxbury, and that's Helen Davis Chandler. Again, a mother, uh, a, a wife, um, and um, clearly um, was very well loved and remembered by her family. Um, and uh, the Liberty Bond uh, drives uh, particularly in Duxbury, didn't involve parades or gatherings or rallies as they had been. But you can see from this certificate of honor, people like this Elijah Reed contributed to it. And $50 was a lot for, for someone uh, like that back then. Um, and um, Duxbury went over the top in its um, Liberty Bond Drive uh, um, that was concluded by the middle of November. Um, there was also the end of the war, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, middle of the month, Nora Denyer died. Uh, she was a young mother um, in Duxbury. She died in Jordan Hospital, which is interesting. Most of uh, the other deaths all occurred at home um, uh, and not in a hospital. So November 11th, the middle of, of the month, um, the news arrived by the morning train uh, on that uh, day of uh, the armistice, and it was known after that as Armistice Day um, and celebrated that way. Um, and uh, it was known it was coming. People were, knew that the, the German armies were falling apart, but it was a huge relief to people. Um, uh, throughout the world that, that the war had finally ended, the Great War, the war to end all wars. Church bells rang all over Duxbury. Um, the um, Old Colony Memorial said there was much noise and jollification in town. People took it as a holiday and, and just celebrated in the streets. There was an imp prompt to parade um, sort of midday, early afternoon in Hall's Corner that involved a, even a band from Rockland and some hastily uh, thrown together floats and things like that. Um, later that night, the Kaiser's effigy was burnt in Hall's Corner. And that was a common thing to do throughout the war as sort of a stick it in your eye to the, um, to the, um, to the German uh, people. And you can see that's not the effigy that was burnt in Hall's Corner, but you can see what uh, an effigy was like and, and what people did. The Powder Point school boys uh, in the Powder Point school uh, went out to the beach and built a giant bonfire that uh, let people celebrate. So it was a big gathering. It was a uh, even in a small town like Duxbury mixing of people and um, we can see that maybe this was a contributing factor in um, events to happen after. This is another great picture of Hall's Corner um, right around 1918 and this is where of course the uh, 
the parade happened and the burning uh, of the effigy and all, but um, this is Hall's Corner, a very different Hall's Corner from, from what we know. There's the Hall's Tavern on the left. Um, we're looking down Washington Street. So that little building in the front uh, was moved back. It became the Dole Endowed um, Jeweler's Shop. Um, and then in the background is the South Duxbury one-room schoolhouse. And you can see the doors for one for boys and one for girls. That was the, the primary school for the South Duxbury area. And then on the corner, um, so the corner of Standish and, and Washington, really, um, were, uh, is a house known as the Harvey Soul House, which had been the post office, had been a store, wasn't in 1918 um, because Harvey Soul had died. Um, and this building is still there. Uh, it was moved down the street um, uh, and uh, is set back now. Just It's the building just before London looks. Um, and it later became the post office again um, up until they built the post office in um, Brothers Plaza there. But uh, so this was, a, a, again, a very different Hall's Corner, uh, but this is uh, what it looked like during 1918 and before all the um, commercial buildings started to be built. So was it the, the joining together for Armistice Day, the mixing of people? Who knows? But um, by December 1918, there was a resurgence of the, of the influenza um, uh, pandemic and, and cases of influenza, not only throughout Massachusetts, but in Duxbury as well. The Powder Point School, which had not closed uh, during the earlier wave, um, did not seem to have been affected, did close early in December because its um, students and particularly its uh, teachers uh, came down with flu. Um, the Old Colony Memorial said that influenza was rife in town um, uh, in early December. The schools closed down, the gathering places, the, the churches closed down. And uh, the newspaper reported that for several weeks there were 12 new cases of influenza a day just in Duxbury, which is a lot. And it was people like Angela Prey. Dr. Noyes, Dr. Spaulding, that really, um, and and the countless women who were volunteer nurses and and um, and part of those um, committees that really made a difference to their fellow townspeople. In mid December, Arthur Bradley died. You can see his stone in um, Mayflower Cemetery. Another tragedy. Another young man. Uh, recently married, um, a child on the way. He was part of the school committee. He had married into the Herrick family. Um, he was uh, very promising. And uh, what was interesting that is that he's one of our early sort of commuters in that he worked in Boston um, as an accountant, and he seems to have taken the, the train almost every day um, into Boston and um, and then um, out to his, his home in Duxbury. Um, but tragically, he died mid-December. But by the end of uh, the year of 1918, uh, again, the, the influenza had burnt itself out amongst the population and was ebbing. <clears throat> in uh, the year 1919, there were still cases. There were about 75 cases in Duxbury for that year, but none were fatal that we know of or that were listed. Uh, but the one that seems to have um, been affected was um, Georgiana Wright. Georgiana Wright, of course, was the matriarch of the Wright family. Uh, they had the big estate on St. George Street. Um, uh, but she had a townhouse in the Back Bay of Boston. She had a New York City apartment. Um, she still had the Wright family um, estate in Brookline. Um, but she was agent. She was the last of the rights. None of her children were alive at that point. Both of her husbands were dead. Um, and she really was alone. Um, and she died of pneumonia in March 1919. 
which likely uh, was a result of influenza. It seems like a lot of pneumonia cases developed out of influenza, and people, particularly older people like Georgiana, died. She was a she and her family were major benefactors, of course, to Duxbury with libraries and the bridge uh, they paid for, and they had lots of land, not just on St. George Street, but owned parts of Patter Point and the Wright Reservoir and places like that. So although she may not be officially classified as dying from influenza, it was clear that she died as a result of the influenza pandemic of 1918. So how can we sum up the the pandemic flu of 1918 in Duxbury? Well, what happened across the country is what happened here in Duxbury as well. There was remembering and there was amnesia. And by remembering, I mean that it was caught up in, in the end of the war uh, um, and the remembering of the people who served in that. Um, and one of them, of course, was Charles Boomer, who died early on in the influenza epidemic. And that triangle of land on the right, uh, which we're all familiar with in front of Town Hall and uh, the First Parish Church, was renamed Charles Boomer Square in honor of him not only because of his service in the army, although he barely had gotten into the army before he died, but also, I think, as, a, as some kind of a, a reminder about the influenza epidemic. Um, and what they wished to put there was the World War I memorial. Um, and there was the original location was going to be in front of Town Hall, um, but there was controversy about that it would destroy the integrity of the three buildings that it was in front of, so it was decided to put it in Boomer Square, um, right in the middle where that um, where that shrubbery is now, and um, there it stood. And you can see a picture on the left um, taken in the 1930s. Uh, so that's obviously not Charles Boomer in the picture, but that's where it stood until, um, ironically, it was uh, run into by um, a car and and fell apart and uh, was taken down and just thrown into the backwoods. And then years later, thanks to Joe Shea, who was dogged in his effort to find that uh, memorial and the pieces of it and get it reconstructed and, and um, raised money and, and paid for the, uh, the reconstruction of that uh, memorial, it was put uh, in front of Town Hall where it original location was going to be, um, and there it stands today. So that's the remembering part. The amnesia is that people throughout the world even, but uh, particularly in this country, and it's true in Duxbury, just, you know, s stopped remembering about the, 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 the flu t pandemic. And we can go on and on about how um, that might uh, have there's psychological reasons for that, but um, what really happened was people forgot about it. They wouldn't tell stories about it. They 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 knew some people who died, but they 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 really weren't affected themselves. But it clearly brought society and uh, small towns and large cities um, to a grinding halt for at least a few months. So that amnesia meant that life just continued on. And, and that's probably uh, a reasonable uh, thing to have happened. Um, and you can see on the right is an old post call, called Waiting for the Mail. And that's on Washington Street. On the right, you can see, uh, and I love this picture because it's a, it's a horse and buggy on the right, I believe, in front of the Peterson um, drugstore, pharmacy, uh, and uh, soda fountain, ice cream store, and then on the left are all the the, the cars, um, uh, and that is the post office on that side, and also the telephone exchange building, uh, where Duxbury had its telephone uh, exchange. But there were 295 reported flu cases in Duxbury in 1918. That is a huge amount for a population of about 1,500. We don't know if any of those were actually summer visitors, but um, it's about 15% of the population came down with the flu uh, in Duxbury. Six died in Duxbury from influenza, but 10 
died from influenza elsewhere. And they were people who were brought to Duxbury to be buried, generally, um, but had family here, grew up here, um, associations with, with the town. And so that's 16 people uh, that really um, were, um, were uh, victims of this uh, 1918 pandemic. So this is a way, this talk is a way to remember that pandemic of uh, 1918, to think about the victims and, and the town of Duxbury as a whole and how it responded uh, to that pandemic and maybe um, see some uh, reflection from our own times and our own pandemic um, uh, issues and problems of 2020. Uh, in this uh, pandemic of 102 years ago and to see how it did affect the town and, and yet life did continue on. So thank you all for listening. I hope you've learned something and um, we'll be happy to take some questions.